Welcome to the season finale of California Limelight. I'm Will Wilson. You know, I must say it's both exhilarating and nostalgic to be wrapping up our very first season. This journey has been nothing short of extraordinary, filled with unforgettable moments and encounters that have left a lasting impression. But we're already gearing up for an electrifying season two with my new and upcoming co-host. In today's jam-packed finale, we're taking a peek into the stunning oasis of the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens. This sanctuary is home to a mesmerizing array of over 500 animals, representing over 150 species. Trust me folks, this is not an adventure you want to miss. We also have a special treat in store as we sit down with legendary sports broadcaster himself, Fred Rogan, for an exclusive interview. And of course, what would California Limelight be without a healthy dose of Hollywood gossip? Get ready to indulge in some juicy tidbits about none other than Jack Nicholson, including a fascinating reflection about his experiences with the iconic Marlon Brando. Last but not least, prepare to be inspired as we hear from Sonny Von Cleveland, whose journey of redemption has led him to open Palm Springs' only cat cafe. It's a heartwarming tale to be sure to leave paw prints on your heart. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the season finale of California Limelight. to the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens, where every visit is a journey into the heart of nature's wonders. As you step through the gates of this nonprofit paradise, you're not just entering a zoo, you're embarking on a mission of conservation, education, and pure joy. With accreditation from the esteemed association of the zoos and aquariums, rest assured that every aspect of animal care, education, and operations here are held to the highest standards. Established in 1970 by visionaries who saw the need to protect the delicate balance of the local desert ecosystem amidst resort development, the Living Desert has flourished into a beacon of hope for wildlife preservation. Their mission? To preserve the rugged beauty of the Colorado Desert, to spread awareness about global ecosystems, and to safeguard endangered species through breeding programs and habitat protection. Wandering through the living desert was like stepping into a living storybook of nature's wonders. With a variety of animals and a butterfly garden, its leisurely stroll that takes about two to three hours invites you to marvel at the variety of fascinating desert creatures and other animals that call this home. One of my personal favorites was seeing and feeding the majestic giraffes. The striking landscape and the breathtaking space where the drafts reside and the unbelievably friendly nature of these beautiful animals with very long tongues was a true highlight. <laughs> Look how long his tongue is. There. Hey, working on him. Hey, was that delicious? Uh -huh. oh, yes, that was so great. Check out online where they're feeding times. It's an experience you won't want to miss. The Living Desert isn't just about admiring exotic animals, it's about learning too. With interpretive exhibits, engaging programs, and informative publications, visitors, young and old, are invited to deepen their appreciation for the diversity of life on our planet. Here are just a few of the animals we saw on our limelight journey. Seeing the cheetah was so cool, as they designed their home where visitors have an unobstructed view of this beautiful creature. Cheetahs are known to be the fastest animal on Earth, and in just a few strides, they can run as fast as a car on the freeway. Their tails act like a rudder on a boat, allowing swift turns midair with superior steering and balance. Unfortunately, cheetahs are facing endangerment. The Living Desert actively participates in cheetah conservation in the International Cheetah Public Engagement Program. There are lots of programs out there to help and sponsor cheetahs. Gracing the meadows is the gazelle. Many types of gazelle are true desert animals. A gazelle swallows its food unchewed, which allows it to consume large quantities of hard to digest plant material at one feeding. Then it goes to rest in a safe place to chew its cud. 
The African painted dog is one of the most fascinating animals as humans have failed to domesticate them. They're extremely loyal to their pack, even taking care of their sick and wounded members. Their coat patterns are as distinguished as fingerprints, and they can specialize in highly intelligent pack communication and teamwork, which has made them one of the most successful hunters in all of Africa, with a 70 to 90% success rate. The Adax, originally from Northern Africa, can live in sandy, stony areas like our desert and can survive extreme temperatures and needing little to no water in their diet. Their kidneys are highly specialized to retain every drop of water they consume due to human activity and habit fragmentation, with only fewer than 100 left out in the wild. The camels were a sight to see. These animals have been highly cherished in the nomadic way of life able to travel 100 miles with the rider or up to 30 miles with a load of 500 pounds. Now the classic eye-catching black and white striped zebra can weigh between 800 to 1,000 pounds. Did you know that zebra stripes are as unique as human fingerprints, which can help researchers recognize and distinguish between them? Researchers also concluded that zebras are black with white stripes. The African spurred tortoise is part of an ancient group of reptiles that originated some 220 million years ago. They can go long periods of time without water, often getting their hydration from the plants that they consume. The locally iconic desert bighorn sheep are masters at climbing and can easily move through the unforgiving Rocky Mountain terrain. Visiting the wallaby exhibit was another incredible experience. There were both yellow-footed rock wallaby and Bennett's wallaby. Normally, we observe the animals from the outside of their enclosure, but this was a unique experience visiting these wallabies because we can be inside their enclosures with them. Originating from Australia, these friendly and cute mini kangaroos were so adorable, and I think they liked me too. So visit and support this oasis of conservation and wonder. Whether you're a nature enthusiast, a family seeking adventure, or simply looking for a day of awe-inspiring fun, the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens promises an experience that will warm your heart and leave you with memories to cherish for a lifetime. So when you're out here in the Coachella Valley, don't miss your chance to see the spectacular Living Desert Zoo and Garden. Coming up, he has been recognized as one of the top sportscasters in the country and has been indicted into the California Sports Hall of Fame. His NBC4 career started in 1980 and he witnessed one of the most iconic decades in LA sports history. Known for his humor and satire, Rogan has enjoyed nearly 50 years in the broadcast industry and has no plans on slowing down just yet. Take a look. Let the games begin. Thank you, Don Pardo, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our biggest night of the year. We've got a lot to show you, and this year we have changed the ground rules just a little bit. I guess we've all had dreams about becoming an all-star at one time or another, a player like a Steve Garvey or a Rod Carew or a past star like Babe Ruth or Ty Cobb. He's been calling Kings games since 1973, so you can imagine how many stories he's got to tell. They're all good, a lot of them very funny, but we only have so much time. It is an honor to be sitting with one of the most legendary sportscasters, uh, Fred Rogan. Thank you so much for joining me. You know, when you said legendary, I was going to look over my shoulder to see if there was somebody sitting over here that was actually legendary. I've just been doing this a long time. You've been in uh, the industry for nearly 50 years. So how can we even summarize that in 10 minutes? What do you think? I think... How could I be in anything for almost 50 years? How <laughs> old am I? If you really think about it, I started in the business when I was 19 years old. And uh, I worked at NBC in LA for 43 years. I never went to college. I went six months to a junior college and started in radio. And I just kept going. And the great thing about our business is it gives you an opportunity to grow and create. You know, I was never just somebody that was a face or a talent. I was always a producer. And I think if you are just a face or the talent, you're perishable. You're like a can of peaches. Eventually your expiration date hits. And if you work as a producer or someone that likes to create, 
and your mind keeps working, you can always work. And I think that's why I've done this for as long as I have. Let's start with your, your true passion that you started out with, radio. And you've reconnected with those radio roots just recently as well. So tell us about what it was about radio that really captured you. Well, first of all, I had a face for radio when I was young, so I thought it's the only thing I could actually do. I was just happy to have a job. Uh, I wanted to be a play-by-play guy, and I went six months to a junior college in Phoenix, which was Phoenix College, and then I left and got a job in Globe, Arizona. I got to do the high school play-by-play on the radio. It was a town of 5,000 in eastern Arizona. and uh, But to do that, to get that part of the job, I also had to do a show every night where I was Uncle Fred, the kitty's friend, the ambassador of Mirth and Merriment. I played top 40 songs. And you had to sell your own radio show. So I did a show from 8 till midnight. I sold my show, and I did the play-by-play. From there, I moved to Yuma, Arizona, where I was rock and roll Rogan every day, 10 to 3, another biscuit from the ever-loving up and hits. <laughs> but I also got to do the Kofi Kings high school football on the radio. And that's what my passion was, sports. So they had a TV station there. And uh, I asked if I could try out to be the TV sports guy because they didn't have anybody. And they looked at me and said, try out. We don't let people try out here. You are the TV (laughs) sports guy. That's how I got on TV. So I get $750 a month for radio and $5 a night for TV. Yeah. From there, I moved to Austin, Texas, the ABC station, TV. Back to Phoenix, where I grew up, born in Detroit, grew up in Phoenix, to the NBC station, and then I came to Los Angeles. But all along, radio was my passion. And I really think if you start in radio, that's in your blood. And it's weird, it's hard to explain, but when it's in you, it's in you. And I also believe, and I tell our interns all the time, if you can do radio, it's much easier for you to do TV. If you do TV, it's very difficult for you to do radio. So I think radio gives you more of the fundamental skills you need as a communicator and a broadcaster. And that's why I kept doing it. And in my time in L.A., I probably 43 years on TV. I've probably done radio on and off for 20 of them. And when I left NBC, I was at KLAC, the Dodger station, um, where I've been for a while. I worked with Rodney Pete. And I'd signed a new deal. I'm happy there. I love it every day. So I just continued on with the radio, which I actually, as we sit here in the studios of KMIR-TV, I do the radio from here. They built me a radio booth. So I can be here and do the radio back to L.A., and the people in L.A. don't know where I'm at. You entered the one of the most iconic decades of uh, L.A. sports history in the 1980s. So tell us about that. What was what was the whirlwind like for you? And to witness all of it, and you, you're the, the face of that, that, era, uh, that decade as well. You're a thousand percent right. <laughs> that was the greatest decade in the history of Los Angeles sports, and I just got there. Uh, I mean, we had the Lakers winning, the Dodgers winning, and L.A. very much. And there are many teams and many people, but the market belongs to the Lakers and the Dodgers. That's it. They're 1-1-A, however you want to look at it. And Dodgers probably are now 1, and the Lakers are 1-A. But watching the titles, seeing the players, Kirk Gibson's home run, uh, the Showtime Lakers, it, it was absolutely remarkable. USC's performances Uh, It was a fun time to be doing that because in our business, in local news, it's always good for business when the home team wins. And people really get caught up with legacy (laughs) brands. And in L.A., those are the legacy brands. And you've also made it into the Hall of Fame, uh, the Sports Hall of Fame. Why don't you tell us about that as well? I'll be honest with you. It's a great honor. Uh, I have won a number of Lifetime Achievement Awards. I've been inducted into a number of Hall of Fames. And one of two things happens when you get to that point. A, you're old. When you get inducted into these things, you are old. B, they've run out of people. So then it's your turn. And lastly, when I win a Lifetime Achievement Award, I always, I've got the line down. I go up, I'm thankful. I say, you know, when I realized that I was being honored like this, it actually brought me to tears. No, not for the honor, but because that means my life is over. Lifetime achievement, (laughs) and I don't think I'm ready to go quite yet. (laughs) What are some of the highlights uh, for for you? What stand out to you the most? You want me to tell you the greatest moment I've had in sports broadcasting? By far, the greatest moment, and it will appeal to you, because it has something to do with Canada. (laughs) 
<laughs> and what's that? Okay. So do you remember when the Olympics were in Vancouver? Yes. Okay. So I was, by the way, in something I took quite seriously, the host of curling. I was America's foremost expert on curling. <laughs> I was the host of curling on NBC. Great. The most exciting sport in the world. Well, once you get to know the people. All right. So anyway, the Canadian men are now playing for the gold medal and they're behind. And I think it's like the sixth or the seventh end. They're playing in Vancouver. They're behind. They're expected to win. And if they don't win, it's going to be a major upset and a huge disappointment, not only for them, but for the country. So they're behind, and I'm sitting in, in the venue. I'm there. That's where my broadcast position was. And all of a sudden, unprompted, I kid you not, someone stands and starts singing the Canadian national anthem. <laughs> and then everybody in that arena stands unprompted <laughs> and sings the Canadian national anthem. And the Canadian men went on to win. And I thought that was the greatest moment I've ever experienced because it was authentic. It was genuine. There was no pretense to it. The crowd believed by singing the national anthem, it would motivate these guys to win. And they did. And by far, that was the greatest moment I've ever experienced. You go, well, you've covered everything. You've been to the World Cup, the World Series. You've done all the Olympics. Uh, you know, the NBA Finals, the Stanley Cup. No, curling in Canada was my <laughs> highlight by far. It's not even close. Uh, what is some advice that you can give to someone who uh, really wants to follow their dreams, and uh, especially for you to have so many wonderful experiences and reconnect with your early roots with radio? Uh, what kind of advice can you give to someone who uh, wants to follow their passion like, like you did? In life, if you chase money, you never find it. You will never catch it. If you do something you're passionate about and connect and work hard, then the money will follow. You have to go in order. I want to be a star and be rich. Well, that's not going to happen for you. Right off the bat, you're done. <laughs> I want to work hard, perfect my craft, and grow. Well, then you could be rich. Well, that's incredible advice. So it's cool to have you here in Palm Springs and to see that uh, your work is also uh, evolving and blossoming. So we look forward to seeing your, your shows. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining me on California Limeline. Well, thanks for coming out and hanging out. <laughs> uh, the Maple Leaf, it's fine. <laughs> Brogan began his broadcasting career in radio and continues to host middays with NFL quarterback Rodney Pete on LA Sports 570 AM in Los Angeles. You can catch him on local TV, NBC Palm Springs, for The Rogan Report. Now speaking of a report, let's tune in to Hollywood. Welcome to the other side of Hollywood. Diving into the successful career of a Hollywood icon who graced our silver screens for over six decades, we find ourselves in awe in Jack Nicholson's timeless contributions to cinema. It's been 14 years since Nicholson had last graced the silver screen, yet his legacy boasts nearly 80 total acting credits. From unforgettable performances in The Departed, The Shining, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Chinatown, As Good As It Gets, and many more. Nicholson's versatility and depth as an actor had left an enduring mark on the industry. During Nicholson's rise to fame, he encountered an unexpected rival in the form of Marlon Brando, the epitome of Hollywood stardom. It was Nicholson who emerged as the most decorated, becoming one of three male actors to clinch three Academy Awards, surpassing even Brando, who had won two Academy Awards. 
Despite being from different eras, Brando perceived the budding Nicholson as a threat to his reign. However, as Brando became to recognize Nicholson's wild antics, it then seemed tensions eased. Nicholson was modest in claiming that they were friends, but they were neighbors for several decades. Their unique dynamic had paved the way for lasting mutual admiration, which endured even after Miranda's passing in 2004. Afterward, Jack Nicholson felt a profound sense of responsibility when he acquired Brando's property with the noble intention of passing it on to Brando's heirs. However, despite his best intentions, Nicholson was met with disinterest from Brando's 11 plus children. Undeterred by the setback, Nicholson decided to demolish the neglected estate, ultimately transforming it into a vibrant garden in 2006 as a heartfelt tribute to Brando's memory. Looks like their stories were just as compelling in real life as their performances were on the screen. For now, Jack Nicholson has not yet officially retired, but he is enjoying a quiet life, doing whatever he wants to do. And that's it for the other side of Hollywood. Coming up is Sonny Von Cleveland, whose journey is a testament to the power of redemption and resilience. From enduring unimaginable crimes as a child to spiraling down a destructive path that had landed him in a dark cell in solitary confinement, Sonny hit rock bottom during his 12 year prison sentence. However, it was within that cell that he had found a glimmer of hope, thanks to a fellow inmate who helped him realize his new potential. Driven by the desire to break free from his victim mentality, Sonny dedicated himself to transformation. He meticulously crafted a vision for his life beyond prison, one that centered on healing and giving back to others. This vision materialized into a foundation aimed at supporting children and youth who have experienced similar traumas, offering them hope and resources for a brighter future. But Sonny's journey didn't just end there. Fueled by his passion for making a difference, he embarked on yet another inspiring endeavor. In addition to his foundation, Sonny, along with his wife Claire, opened up a cat cafe, driven by the goal of providing shelter cats with a safe and nurturing environment, while simultaneously connecting them with loving forever homes. I'm sitting with Sonny Von Cleveland, so thank you so much for joining us here on Limelight. Of course, thanks for having me. Yeah, you have a very inspirational story, so a story that your early life had a lot of turbulence and unfortunately led you down to a lot of really tough uh, a tough path. And then from there, you were able to really rebuild your life and, and really contribute not only to uh, Palm Springs through the Cat Cafe, but of course through your foundation, the Von Cleveland Foundation. Yeah. So you have a lot to share. So tell us all about your different endeavors and especially how uh, you had this road of redemption. Well, it's, um, my life was, was really rough as a child. Um, you know, it was, there was a lot of abuse and uh, I had gone down a really dark path for quite a while, and I didn't quite know how to deal with all that as a child. Uh, but during a, a particular long stretch in solitary confinement, I met a, uh, an amazing man who, who instilled into me some wisdom that I had never had before and kind of taught me how to process emotion and, and self-forgiveness and forgiveness of other people. And I read a book that he had sent me by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. <laughs> and in there, there's a, a line that really resonated with me, and it was it said, "Suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it has a purpose." And and when I heard that, it it, it helped me to define that everything that I had gone through was a purpose. There was a purpose for it, right? Like the, if if I give it a meaning, it's no longer suffering. And so, going through the process of of self forgiveness and processing emotion. I learned that if I give my life meaning and I, I take what I've been through and I help other people realize how to process emotion and, and forgive themselves, then I've given it a purpose. And so I just dedicated my life to that. Uh, and then, you know, I, after I got out of, of the penitentiary in 2016, I got into music uh, and realized pretty quickly that this wasn't a, a path that was going to allow me to teach the things that I had been taught. And so... I moved out from Cleveland out to here to, to Palm Springs and it's such a welcoming community, right? Like we live in such an amazing place. And, and, uh, my wife and I decided to open up a, a cat cafe and I didn't even know what it was. So let's <laughs> open up a cat cafe. And I said, oh, okay. What is that? And 
Uh, and so it's a coffee shop that has cats in it. Uh, that we're partnering with the Palm Springs Animal Shelter, and it helps these cats get visi greater visibility to get adopted. There was something that resonated with me with that. Getting these cats out of these cages and helping them find homes, right? Like these cats have been lost and, and broken and, and, and abused and, and then stuck into a cage. And, and there was something that just really resonated with me. And I'm like, okay, let's do that. <laughs> and so we've done almost 90 adoptions now since we've opened. And, and then that put me in a position where I saw more opportunity to help people. And I met so many incredible people through the cafe, uh, including people to, to network with that got me into the juvenile hall. And when I saw the opportunity to go into the juvenile hall and speak to some of these kids, I mean, they range from 12 years old up to 20, and, and they've made a mistake in their life. And, and if I could go in there and just give them a little bit of wisdom, because I was, I was you, I was there once, and if I can help you, and then all that spawned into writing this book. I'm, my wife was like, we need to put your life down in a story. And I'm like, yeah, let's do that. So Right. And, and so what you mentioned, so I read the book, and uh, a lot of what you're, you're talking about is uh, captured in this book. One of my favorite characters was, of course, who you brought up, your mentor uh, in, in prison, uh, Mallory. Right? Yeah. And he's a pretty, sounds like a pretty cool guy, right? And uh, He was all right. Yeah, well, and the fact that he never, he, he saw something in you and he never gave up on you. And of course, you know, you'd think that tough exterior that you not only uh, presented, but you really actually built internally uh, oh. was able to, he was able to break through that. And, and more importantly, you were able trying. to break through that. Yeah, so, he, he, I was very resistant for a long time uh, and I was so angry and... And that was the first thing he had said to me when I decided to talk to him. That was the first thing he ever said to me. He was, hey, white boy. <laughs> <laughs> when I finally decided to talk to him, I had just been told that I was going to be in solitary confinement for five years. And I, I, was, I was trying to process that. And he called me. And I'm, what, man? What do you want to talk about, <laughs> man? He said, why are you so angry? So I was like, what kind of question is that? <laughs> you had all the right, you, yeah, of course. I'm in the seems... hole, my life sucks, you won't shut up. There's a lot of reasons why I'm angry. And he said, no, man, that's why you're mad. And mad is a surface emotion. Anger runs much deeper. And it just blew me away. I'm like, I never thought about that. And right. then that started the process, right? And, right. And Something that would be reflective, of course, of your journey. And then uh, you also mentioned this is um, uh, mm -hmm. really important that, um, you know, we didn't choose what happened to us if we become a victim of something, but we choose to stay a victim. And I feel none like that's very, I even ever, get goosebumps just thinking about None of us that. ever choose to be victimized, but every single one of us choose to stay a victim. If I'm robbed at an ATM, Somebody comes up and robs me. That's not my fault, right? I didn't plan for that. I didn't ask for that. I didn't say, hey, come rob me at this ATM. <laughs> but it's my choice if I look at that and allow the world around me to instill fear into me now and, and walk around the rest of my life afraid to go to an ATM machine because the potential to be robbed again is there, right? I, I, that's my choice. I get to, to, I can separate reality from fear and know that the chances of that happening again are probably pretty slim. I've been to an ATM a thousand times and have never been robbed. <laughs> and the one time I do get robbed, it's probably not going to happen again. And so if I can sit down and separate the emotion from the event and, and look at it logically, more often than not, we don't get victimized twice. Right. Absolutely. And, and so, of course, your your foundation, the Von Cleveland Foundation, uh, really uh, works towards that, you know, and uh, really helps people who, who might feel that they're stuck. The people that really need it can't afford it. How do I make it accessible for them? They can't afford $2,000. How do I do that? And somebody had told me, you should design a nonprofit and, and give it away. And I thought, what a genius. I didn't know what a, <laughs> what a nonprofit was. I had no idea what that was. And, and there's so many people that have charitable hearts and philanthropic hearts. And so I designed it. I'm like, okay, let's do that. Went through it and found out. And then I seen that there's just so much more opportunity. So we build mindset libraries. We take an entire bookshelf handcrafted and we put 50 mindset books on them. And we donate it to facilities. Like we donate it to them to the juvenile facility or, or the day reporting center. Or, or a, a rehab facility, and, and these tools are, are can save lives. 
and, and so we build these shelves and we give them away, but we're also designing the, the Igniting Mind Speaking Symposium, which is like a TEDx, except we'll find local people in the area that have overcome amazing circumstances to have a successful life, and we will put them on stage and invite the community in for free. Come in and, and get some of this knowledge and this wisdom and this inspiration to help better your life. And it just it allows the community to to partake in these mindset shaping events and, and wisdom from other people. So if anyone wants to visit the Cat Cafe and uh, find out about where your book and your foundation, how can they find all that information out? Well, we're the only cat cafe in the Coachella Valley, <laughs> so you can literally just put in cat cafe, uh, but it's called Frisky Business, Palm Springs Cat Cafe, <laughs> and whatever you do, please put cat cafe. If you don't just put Frisky Business, I am not responsible for what you find. <laughs> we didn't think that one through. Uh, my my sister-in-law <laughs> gave me a gift certificate to that, and I certainly was like, whoa, what is she thinking? But it was a cat yes. cafe, and it was a great transformation <laughs> journey journey so and, and then yeah and then for me you can go to heywhiteboy.com you can go to the von cleveland foundation.org or you can just go to sunnyvoncleveland.com uh, and you'll find links and access to everything that i do we wish sunny and his team great success it has been an honor to have hosted california limelight thank you for joining me on this journey and thank you to fiesta ford whose enduring support empowered us to put amazing people places and events into the limelight season two is coming up this april and i'll be introducing my new co-host for now don't forget to like and subscribe i'm will wilson and see you soon